starting off um, with bone structure. Um, a bone itself is comprised of calcium, collagen, and phosphate. There's no exact percentages in terms of how a bone is broken down between those three elements um, because bone is constantly absorbing, reabsorbing um, through osteoclasts and osteoblasts, which we'll talk about as well. Um, collagen and phosphate are found in different parts of your body, but um, if you have any calcium in your body, about 99% of that is in bone. The other 1% is in your blood, but uh, calcium is what primarily makes up the bone structure in your body. So uh, when discussing orthotic management of fractures, we're primarily reviewing long bones, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're looking just at uh, femur or humerus. Um, while long bones do refer to the length and not the width of the bone, long bones are um, also classified in your feet and in your hands. Um, so even though they're relatively small, they still count under the guidelines for what a long bone technically is. Um, the four other types of bones are short, flat, irregular, and sesamoid. Um, we won't get into those too much because they're simply not as statistically susceptible to fractures and therefore we don't end up working with them a ton. So, um, The long bone function has two main goals or two main jobs. It's supporting the body weight and facilitating movement via a lever system. Those levers, of course, being the muscles, tendons, and ligaments that surround a bone and ordering it to facilitate movement. When we're talking about mechanical properties of bones, we're talking primarily about stress versus strain, specifically when we're talking about fractures. These are the elements that act on a bone in order to, unfortunately, cause it to break. So. Um, stress is the force per unit area applied to a material. That's your textbook definition. Um, stress has its own unit. It's called the Pascal. This unit is newtons per square meter. That's how it's measured in. It's not measured in pounds or, or anything else like that. That's, that's how we'll measure how much stress is applied. One Pascal is equal to one newton per square meter. Strain is the response or the deformation. Um, of a system to an applied stress. That's that textbook definition. Now, stress um, is, I'm sorry, strain does not have a unit. It's a ratio. It's measured as a ratio. Um, now you can, of course, apply two metrics to a ratio. So it will be measured in um, meters per meter or inch per inch. And that's how much um, we'll look at those. So um, stress and strain are the two things that will cause a fracture. and. Um, we'll look into tension and compression as well. So um, tension, like it says there, a force that pulls materials apart. Compression, a force that squeezes materials together. Um, anytime a long bone is doing its job, supporting the body weight, um, it will be under both tension and compression. The easiest example to look at this is the femur. The top of this femur here goes into the hip and therefore um, will support, you know, if you have two femurs, you're supporting about half the body weight through those femurs respectively. So also important to consider where the applied force or the stress is coming from. So in this instance, it's coming from above, but different directional forces will influence what aspect of the bone is under tension and under compression. So as we see these blue arrows kind of transfer on down, your tension is on, in this case, the outside, and your compression is on the inside. And notice that this compression does not necessarily run throughout the inside of that femur, the inside of that bone throughout. It does get dispersed, and we'll look at that in a little bit, um, especially through the bottom. I thought this graph did a nice job of kind of showing how um, it's not on just the inside, especially at the bottom. It does kind of separate and it will run throughout. So this is why we get fractures splitting in multiple ways, multiple severities, all that good stuff. So um, bone is anisotropic meaning that its physical property is different in value when measured in different directions. So um, a common example or a simple example of this is wood, which is stronger along the grain than against it. Bone reacts and works for the most part in the same way. So this is important because it makes the long bones vulnerable to fracture when loading occurs from a specific direction. Um, again, same thing here. We kind of see our radiographic image and then a little bit more of a, an illustrated drawing to the right. I won't get into everything with regards to the uh, neck of the femur just yet. I want to look at just that outside where your trochanter is, where that bony aspect of the outside of your femur is. And if you can kind of imagine just how that red arrow, if you could, in theory, get a force directly applied to the top of your trochanter, how that would easily kind of shear off that little edge there. 
Whereas if you were to apply that red arrow from the outside, it may not shear off so much as it would compress. So um, we can begin to imagine the direction of both the bone structure and the applied force and how that'll dictate the outcome of a fracture. And again, this is why we see fractures um, that look different almost every time. If it's, you know, it can be a very similar force, a very similar um, direction, but if the person's a different age, if the bone is structured differently, um, based off things like osteoporosis, then we're gonna get a different looking fracture. And that kind of runs into our gamut of, you know, how do we fit these people with braces? How do we go about the rehabilitation process moving forward? So moving more into mechanical properties. And again, for, for now, we're just looking at a femur. We'll talk more about different bones and different reactions of different bones. But for now, I just wanna focus on the femur while we can. So. Just to really drive this point home, we're looking at um, two major classes with five different categories, again, just in the femur for this part. Um, the humerus, uh, the cervical spine, that all works very differently. But there's intertrochanteric, subtrochanteric, inter and subtrochanteric, kind of a combination of the two, the femoral neck and the greater trochanter. So um, each type of fracture, even in this subset, can carry with it a different surgical intervention, a different orthotic intervention, and ultimately a different treatment plan. Mechanical properties moving forward, bone is also viscoelastic in, in addition to being anisotropic. So uh, viscoelastic simply meaning that the property of the materials exhibit a viscous and an elastic principle when undergoing uh, deformation. So viscous materials um, such as honey, for example, resist strain linearly with time when a stress is applied and elastic materials strain when stretched and quickly return to their original state once the stress is removed. So um, as we see here, when you get a high rate of loading, you get a high energy storage. Um, these fractures, the high rate of loading, the high energy storage result in multiple cracks, kind of this um, very brittle kind of splintering effect. A low rate of loading and a low energy storage, these are the fractures that we commonly see resulting in a single crack or a single fracture ranging in how, uh, how severe it is with regards to its length, but it'll um, inevitably, inevitably be a single fracture throughout. So um, this is also a time dependent thing, as you can tell. So um, if it happens very quick, very abruptly, um, these are things like uh, car accidents or falls. Um, these are commonly where we get you know, multiple fractures with chips, avulsions, stuff like that. Um, slower fractures or fractures that occur slowly with a loaded rate and a loaded time, we get the single cracks. Wolf's Law, um, Julius Wolf was a German anatomist and physicist, um, a surgeon also of the 19th century, who outlined this, uh, just kind of this use it or lose it principle of bone. Um, the concept of bone remodeling where form follows function essentially. So. Um, bone has the ability to adapt by changing its size, shape, and structure due to the, due to the mechanical demands placed on it. Um, what this essentially means is um, it's alive. Bone is not simply a, a, you know, a slap of concrete inside your body. Bone is very much alive. It, uh, like we said, absorbs, reabsorbs. Um, it's living, it's constantly growing, remodeling, reshaping. And if you act on it in a way, it will react to that and it will grow according accordingly. So bone is laid down, osteoblasts were needed and reabsorbed osteoclasts where they're not needed. There's also osteocytes. I know I'm skimming over that in case anyone's like wondering where the heck that process is in here. We're just going to skip over that for now because that's a little more complicated. But the remodeling may be either external or internal. And um, external meaning that the change is the actual shape of the bone. That's the external aspect that we can see when a bone reacts to uh, forces being applied to it. The internal is a change in uh, the bone itself, such as the porosity, such as the mineral content, and the, uh, the actual density itself, how dense the bone is. These mechanical properties continued are um, kind of break down into three, uh, I don't wanna call them phases, but uh, three major changes that we see. So there's um, the immediately after, there's you know, the initiation of the fracture um, this will cause a blood clot and a callus to form around the fractured site. That includes, again, all ligaments, tissues, everything around that site, not just the bone itself, but a callus, a blood clot will form. These new threads in the middle section here, these new threads will form basically bone cells. They're start, they'll start to grow on both sides of the fracture um, towards one another. They'll start to reach out to each other. 
and then eventually we see absorption. Uh, we'll go through when and where we expect these things to be seen exactly, but to, to grossly uh, state these, this healing process in, in three stages would, would be immediately after, so as soon as it happens, the bone cell growth and the absorption phase. So more force stimulates osteoblasts. Again, we're looking at um, the inside and the outside of a femur. So as that weight line that we saw earlier with the blue lines kind of goes through the inside, you're getting more force, you're getting some tension, and you're causing it to react on the inside because you get less force. It's more of a strain on the outside. It stresses on the inside. So the osteoblasts deposit bone on the inside curvature and osteoclasts remove bone from the outside curvature. And eventually, this will evenly distribute itself or at least average itself out. This doesn't mean that your femur is perfectly straight and you're gonna you know, be taller, but it will say that this femur will react and it'll eventually take the averages and it will um, shape itself externally into a manner in which it's stable and not as susceptible um, to fractures. So this is not always the case, of course, and I won't bother to go into the variety of pathologies that we see with uh, bone abnormalities when it doesn't react and act the way that it should. But um, one common example we see as orthotists is in pediatric patients who have something called Blount's disease. And Blount's disease, um, while not a fracture, does kind of drive this idea home that what can happen when bone does not properly react. So Blount's disease develops during er early childhood and can also be managed orthotically, like I said, with bracing in general. Um, we see this kind of ground reaction force where the weight line is, this red line through the inside of both this patient's knees. And again, we see our stress, our strain, our tension, our compression. But what happens here in this case when it's not reacting properly is that it just goes. It just kind of curves to the outside. And we'll talk about more about how we as orthotists can correct that with uh, three-point pressure systems. Um, but this was just a good example of, of basically something not going right. Um, and the weight line can still be transferred from the hip, from the top of that femur, all the way to where it should be on the ankle, but everything in between we see here is off. Getting into classifications um, for any fracture of a long bone, now not just the femur, but any fracture, can be uh, simple or compound. Um, we'll cover this a little later, but as you can imagine, there are a lot of other fractures that go into orthotically managing a compound fracture when the compound fracture is actually moved outside of the body and you know, has exposed itself through the skin, there are a multitude of things that we need to therefore accommodate, like skin condition, any sutures that have likely taken place, um, swelling if it's immediately after the fracture, everything like that now has become factors that we'll manage um, orthotically. So um, complete versus incomplete is another thing that matters greatly to us when we consider what type of brace is appropriate for a fracture. Um, complete just meaning that the fracture is associated with the separation of bone into two discrete fragments. This picture obviously has a little bit more of a drastic illustration, but a complete fracture can be totally complete and millimeters apart. Still a complete fracture, it still means we have two completely mobile segments independent of each other. An incomplete fracture um, has some contact or continuity between bone fragments. Again, these come in different severities. You can have just a tiny little chip and it can be you know, an incomplete, or you can have that thing barely hanging on, but it still counts. You still have two, uh, I'm sorry, you still have one totally complete segment that's together that we don't need to worry about moving independent of each other. So our types of classifications, um, these are just some of them, um, but this is, I thought, a good example of what we'll consider orthotically. So transverse fractures, again, complete or incomplete, but transverse in that they run along kind of the horizon together. An impacted fracture, um, we talked about falls, I mentioned falls earlier very quick. Um, these are commonly saying where the bone has actually um, compressed to the point where it cannot compress anymore, and that stress has caused it to essentially um, Implode sounds like such a harsh word, but cause to implode in and on itself to where the impacted fracture is essentially self-sustaining, self-causing. Stress fracture, um, a fracture within a bone, these can be due to overuse. Um, stress fractures can be, become a, be because of a multitude of things, such as osteoporosis, um, but a stress fracture is essentially something to where the bone has uh, found a weak point in and of itself and that weak point has been exposed to the point where it is now a fracture, it can't handle that stress, it's now deformed. Um, an oblique fracture, not running completely along the horizon, but essentially running at an angle. Avulsion fracture means a part of the bone, a chip, if you will, of the bone has come apart. These are commonly seen where a ligament 
or a muscle to a lesser degree, but mostly a ligament is attached to a part of the bone and it has caused itself to pull apart. The bone has caused itself to pull apart based off the ligament's attachment point and an action that caused that. A spiral fracture. Um, this is different than an oblique fracture in that it runs along an axis, but it's not, um, if you can think of the Z axis, it doesn't run along just an X and a Y, but it has actually roped around like a candy cane to where it has um, multiple angles and vectors and uh, it is really kind of wrapped around itself here. Um, a green stick fracture. Um, this is where we can talk a little bit more about three-point pressure systems. So with a green stick fracture, your actions that have occurred here um, are uh, three-part for the most. They are one from the inside and then in this case two from the outside that have really kind of, if you can imagine trying to break a pencil, um, it has essentially caused part of that and is again an incomplete fracture, but it has essentially caused part of that bone to chip. Um, looking into a little bit of orthotic management, what we, what we therefore do is we therefore look to oppose those reactions. Now notice the outside two green arrows that are closest to each other. These are not directly on the fracture site. We'll talk about this a little bit more later on, but we never want to apply or we usually don't want to apply a force directly onto a fracture site. If we can, we want to move away from it, but still get the necessary corrective force that we want. Um, so with green stick fractures, a lot of the times what we'll see is we'll see um, a three-point pressure system or something there similar that has caused the fracture and we're correcting that with either a three or a four-point pressure system. Another thing I want to point out real quick is that these green arrows um, are as far apart as they can be on the inside and that's because we don't want isolated pressure, we don't want to cause any deformity, we want as much leverage as we can and what leverage does for us is it allows us to um, correct uh, fracture or correct a deformity with as little force as possible. We want as little actual, um, as little force because we want more leverage on it, which will let us essentially get better outcomes because the patient is generally a lot more tolerable to less pressure on a fracture if you can simply, lose, simply use leverage. Um, more types of fractures, uh, fracture dislocation. I don't think I need to elaborate on um, how severe these can be. If you have a dislocated bone in addition to a fractured bone, these will, I don't know the statistics, but I can tell you these will almost always require surgical intervention at some point. So um, these will be uh, orthotically managed in addition, in addition to surgically managed. Stress or fatigue fracture produced by repeated overuse body part. Um, again, we looked at that briefly earlier. The bone has found a soft spot in and of itself and it's caused that to, uh, to fracture at that soft spot. So pathological fractures may be treated orthotically but often an underlying complication is involved. Um, so pathological fractures occurs through a weak bone or abnormal composition, results from normal use or mild injury to an area weakened by underlying disorders or local conditions. So a uh, patient may have an osteoporotic bone or um, some sort of disorder, some sort of abnormality within the bone. This is important because if we place excessive strain on a bone to fix one fracture, we may simply uh, cause another. And that's something we need to uh, consider as orthotists, we need to talk about as well. Um, while you do want to correct as much as you can, sometimes there is a limit. And if you overcorrect, you can cause a fracture, you can cause a deformity, and therefore we've uh, done a little too much and now we have something else to consider. Fracture locations change a lot. We looked earlier at a graph that kind of showed uh, essentially an illustration with, uh, again, wood grains throughout the neck of the femur in relation to a radiographic image right next to it. Um, that was just that segment of the uh, neck of the femur. If you go up and down the diaphysis, the metaphysis, the epiphyseal plate, each of those has their own special wood grain structure, if you will. So each of those is gonna split, splinter, fracture in a different orientation depending on where the bone is and who, whose bone that is to begin with. So um, these are susceptible to fractures in different orientations. And um, again, I don't have the statistics, but I can tell you that the oblique, the spiral fractures, obviously are gonna occur more so in the uh, diaphysis, the, essentially the shaft, the mid part of the bone. Um, and then the top, the epiphysis, stuff like that, that's where we see our avulsion fractures, more attachment points, more insertion, more origin points in those parts. Fracture location, whether it's proximal, mid, or distal, and what sort of bone it's attached to also play a huge part in this. Um, so when do we expect each of these bones to heal exactly? Um, these are general healing times. 
These can be complicated by a variety of things, such as uh, loss of blood supply, infection, lack of nutrition. These are fairly gross timelines with regards to when we expect each of these to heal. So phalanges um, are your the very distal, the very far part of your fingers, your toes, um, and your hands. So uh, radius, ulna, forearm, humerus, clavicle, each have different fracture times. A couple more to look at here. Um, when we look at the femur, which we have been doing, tibia, fibula, forearm, and we'll notice as we look at these that each of these have fairly like exponentially different times in which they're expected to heal. Um, so mainly this is due to size and blood supply. There are of course several other factors that go into it, but how large a bone is, how good its blood supply is, is why we expect these to heal at different rates. Um, the amount of uh, blood vessels, nerves, everything at the very end of your hands and your toes um, is much greater than along the midpoint of your femur, the midpoint of your forearm. And with that greater blood supply, we're able to expect a quicker healing process. Um, we're expected to see that um, the size that requires um, is gonna help us out. What I mean by that is that when you have a femur that fractures, um, it has a lot of room in which it can fracture. If you have a fracture that runs the length of your femur, blood supply is one thing, but you just simply have a large amount of surface area to cover. Whereas if you fracture the very end of your finger, the very end of your toes, there's only so much room to work with there. You only have so much surface area to reconnect and, and, and to grow back together. Um, general management. Um, reduction is simply correction of displaced fracture fragments. So. Closed reduction can be obtained by uh, gentle manipulation, usually under a general or a local anesthetic, although um, this is becoming less and less of a, of a trend simply because it's simply not warranted, we found. It's generally tolerable, it's um, painful for a while, but it goes away quickly, and once we've reduced that bone back to where it is, it normally feels a heck of a lot better. So, um, immobilization, maintenance of reduction. Immobilization, um, external, non-invasive, it's uh, maintenance traction, internal fixation, external skeletal fixation. That's, that's the kind of stuff we're talking about with um, immobilization and maintenance of reduction. And then we want early restoration of function. Uh, we don't want too early. There is obviously a little bit of a sensitive timetable on which we have to work with here. Um, but we want, as soon as we can at least, we want to be able to restore function, get that thing moving, get the blood supply going again. Um, and that way we can get the patient going on to the, re, uh, to the rehabilitative process. So, um, complications of fractures. So we talked a little bit earlier about a compound fracture, how it goes through the skin, um, will be more prone to infection, for example. Um, delayed union or non-union, when we can't totally um, reduce that fracture, when we can't totally get the uh, complete fractures together, that's gonna cause us a little bit of a delay um, in terms of when we would expect that timetable, that gray chart to show uh, a healed fracture. Vascular compromise, we talked about blood supply, blood flow. If you don't have as good of a blood supply or don't have as good of a blood flow, we're gonna expect that fracture to take a little longer. And then misalignment, if you get things that have been reduced, that have been um, basically maintained to where the fractures are back together, um, but they're a little off, then, you, then your surface area, the amount of surface area that that bone to bone has, um, has now caused us to have a weaker bone and or caused us to simply take longer. Um, when would we not put a brace? When would we not orthotically manage a fracture? Um, if there is excessive wound drainage, um, that generally means it's a little too early. <laughs> it generally means that we've kind of jumped the gun and uh, we need to back off a little bit. So uh, spastic disorders, um, main thing here is with any sort of um, spastic disorder ranging from um, TBIs to cerebral palsy is um, if we put a brace on someone, we want to make sure that it's going to be able to hold them and hold them safely. If they have incontrollable spasms or if they're able to like kick or, or punch their way out of something incontrollably, then we don't want to brace them in a way that's going to hold them there. Um, there's no use in fighting an incontrollable jerk. We're simply going to rub the skin raw. We're simply going to cause more pain, more irritation and um, no one at the end of the day is gonna be happy, so. Anesthetic limbs, anesthetic simply mean that the patient is um, insensitive to pain. So um, if they kick or they punch, that's one thing. If they kick and they punch and they can't feel it, that's a whole nother thing because um, while there might be a nurse there in some instances, 
In some instances, there's not. And at that point, we need the patient to be able to self-monitor a fracture site um, or a brace and say, yeah, I'm getting skin irritation, or yeah, it's rubbing me, it hurts, I can feel it. Because if that's the case, if they're getting skin irritation, if it's hurting and they can't feel it, then that generally results in some sort of skin breakdown, some sort of wounds that gets them out of the brace and generally gets them back into a doctor's office quicker. Severe soft tissue damage, um, for the most part, I think this speaks for itself. If you have muscles, if you have tendons, ligaments, stuff like that, that um, are injured and are inflamed, then we don't want to stick a brace on that. It's only going to hurt. We're probably not going to get the reduction we want. And again, at the end of the day, another great reason to not go ahead and brace a fracture, at least in that instance. Management of functional fracture bracing. So functional bracing is an effective therapeutic modality in the management of selected fractures, um, specifically the tibia, the humerus, the ulna, um, particularly to low energy injuries that, that you know, like low rate of low time of load and low rate of load. So Sarmiento method, um, Sarmiento um, normally applies to humeral fractures. I don't know if anyone's seen, it's essentially a plastic brace with a wrap around. We'll go over all the braces earlier, but just to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about right now. Um, this is a guided physio physiologically induced motion to spur osteogenesis, meaning that we want to go ahead and, um, in this case, the humerus, we want to go ahead and let the arm, let the humerus move, but at the same time, reduce it and control that fracture as much as we can, getting it back into a good spot. If you completely immobilize an entire segment or an entire limb, what you're gonna do is you're gonna reduce blood supply, you're gonna reduce how active that patient is overall, and we're trying to get those things going quicker. So um, Sarmiento was essentially an individual who said, you know, if you can get the reduction you need while still letting the patient move, while still letting the patient have that blood supply increase, then everything's great and we can go ahead and do that. Hydrostatic pressure via soft tissue compression um, to maintain alignment. Um, again, looking just at a humerus in this case, but if we can squeeze and not enacting directly on a bone, if we can just squeeze through the tissues, squeeze through some of those muscles, again, that are not inflamed, that, have not, that don't have any damage, if they're healthy tissue otherwise, and we can squeeze through it, we find that that works very well and that we can still act on a bone without, without having to totally do a direct point of pressure. We talked about three-point pressure systems a little bit earlier. When you have these fractures that are um, oblique and that they have multiple different axes, what we want to do is we want to just go ahead and squeeze circumferentially or hydrostatically, and we can load them generally back to where they want. Now, when we fit a brace, when we fit a Sarmiento brace, for example, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure we have that alignment. So we'll go ahead and do a, a pre-brace x-ray to see where we were at, and then we'll try to do a post-brace x-ray to make sure that this hydrostatic loading is indeed what we're getting. If you need to cross a joint, joints are to remain free range of motion as to not create excessive motion at the fracture site. Um, principle of the treatment by fracture bracing is to allow early mobilization, like we said, and the initial cast, um, which we're not gonna talk about casting much, but the initial cast is removed um, within two weeks and the limb is put into a functional brace. So our ideal timeline for Sarmiento bracings of the humerus, for example, generally seven to 10 days and the reason for that, the reason we don't put a Sarmiento brace on a humeral fracture immediately is from the reasons that we talked about earlier where um, there's generally swelling, there's generally a lot of pain, we have some edemic tissue to work through, we need to let all that calm down before we move forward with the brace. So. Traditional casting versus functional bracing. Um, functional bracing is best applied to simple low energy fractures. So. Other methods of treatment, such as external fixation and closed intermedullary nailing, have become preferred treatment for many complicated fractures. Traditional casting and functional bracing um, apply the same principles. We want to make sure that the fracture is reduced. We want to make sure the surface area of the two bones are connected to where that three part, uh, that three stage healing can begin. However, um, Casting and functional bracing uh, are also two very different things in that casting requires complete immobilization, sometimes crossing a joint, whereas functional bracing will allow um, what we need, what we want in that, in that healing, in that x-ray process, but it'll allow the patient to still move. And um, more importantly, from a patient's standpoint, it might allow them for part of the day to take that thing off and to bathe it and to wash it, to shower, some of those things. Um, Underrated to us sometimes as orthotists, but we try not to ignore that entirely because we know that's a very important part uh, of the patients. So, um, when we look at uh, the objective of the fracture, 
uh, orthotic system is to apply a device that allows early graded function capable of responding to volume changes in the injured extremity after resolution of the acute symptoms. It is an active system that requires regular monitoring by the healthcare team and compliance of the patient. So all those contraindications we talked about earlier apply here. So if a patient can't feel anything, we're going to be a little hesitant. If the patient is having spasms, we're going to be a little hesitant. And um, even things such as like cognitive ability, are they able to understand what's really going on here are things that um, we as orthotists need to monitor, excuse me, and things that um, the physician, the referring physician and the healthcare team in general need to consider is, is this brace appropriate for the patient based off the pathologies that we see in our goals, but is this patient going to be discharged? Are they going to have to apply this brace themselves? Do they have somebody that can help them? Um, is this going to be something the patient can independently use is a big question we have to ask ourselves a lot. Now, I told you why we might do a functional bracing versus a cast. I'm going to flip to the other side. Some of the reasons here are why we would just use a cast. Do we want this patient to be able to take this brace off? Maybe not. Do we trust this patient to go ahead and clean this thing? Maybe not. So um, again, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, I'd like to think we do a good job, but that's a biased opinion. So. Um, we're still working on it. You know, it's something that we do every day and um, the healthcare team, at least where I work out of here at UCSF, I think is great. So um, appropriate donning, positioning, following therapeutic regimen and compliance is crucial and successful outcome of functional outcome racing. Um, OTS stands for off the shelf. Um, this is a little bit of like a harsh term in our field because it's not necessarily where you just grab one, like a size large left. Um, there is obviously some like clinical expertise that goes into an off-the-shelf brace, but off-the-shelf nonetheless meaning that it's something that we order from a manufacturer and we're able to fit for the most part by itself as is, as it comes with minimal trimming, aligning, padding, stuff like that. Um, custom is something that you would see here. So this brace is a custom brace, meaning that measurements were taken, a fiberglass cast was taken, this thing was usually or normally poured with plaster of the cast, we stripped it, we modified it, we pulled thermoplastic over it, we added pads to this, we, we riveted some straps to this. This thing took time. This thing took some effort to make and um, is, is generally you know, where, where, where our area of expertise really comes into play with regards to bracing. So um, custom bracing can be indicated for deformities. When you order that you know, off the shelf size large left, it may not accommodate for the fact that um, that patient's femur is bowed out like we saw earlier. It may not be something that thing can fit. So um, multiple fracture control. When we talk about a Sarmiento brace, it has you know the length that it covers here. If you have multiple fractures throughout that arm, then we probably need something custom. That does or does not have joints and does or does not have adjustable range of motion. Um, long bone fractures and pathological in nature, osteogenesis imperfecta, osteoporosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and then post-surgery. Um, post-surgery bracing sometimes is contraindicated, sometimes it's not. And generally when we talk about, again, soft tissue damage, swelling, edema, stuff like that, um, if we need something for that, it sometimes requires a custom brace. Um, long bone fractures, tibia, femoral, humeral, ulnar, forearm, both bone fractures, clavicle, and, spi and spinal fractures. Um, spinal fracture, uh, of course, is not a long bone. It's a oblique, or it's a unique bone rather, but it comes in um, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and there are different aspects of each that we need to uh, go ahead and account for. Again, our main goal with tibial fractures, caster splint applied to obtain optimum alignment and correction in the application of the brace. So the earlier brace that we saw, the custom one, it's for a tibial fracture. Um, tibial fractures can be very high, they can be very proximal up on the tibia, and therefore you need to cross the knee joint and or the ankle joint, which generally indicates the need for a custom brace. A tibial fracture orthosis, if it's not very high or if it's not incredibly proximal on the tibia, can be done with an off-the-shelf brace like we see here. Um, these off-the-shelf uh, tibial fracture braces are generally relatively lightweight. They can get a little air in there, as you see. They have a little bit of holes, which helps out with that. Um, the distal attachment is to prevent the orthosis from sliding down, avoids rotational deformities, so we still have good control. This may not necessarily mean hydrostatic pressure, but it does mean that it doesn't allow the brace to freely rotate um, on the patient. Proximal femoral condyle extension assists in providing bending and rotary stability, and the prefabricated orth orthosis fit about 90% of the patients for the tibial fractures that we see um, 
and customization of these, again, is needed for optimum fit. This doesn't necessarily mean that it's off the shelf and that we simply order it and hand it off. We need to fit these. We need to make sure everything is exactly where it needs to be, and we need to know why it needs to be there. Freedom of movement of the ankle and knee joints facilitates physiological contraction of musculature, which promotes reduction of swelling. Short walks, and uh, then we encourage the patient to elevate the limb to prevent swelling. Full range of motion of proximal and distal joints to avoid joint tightness and contractures. Malalignment of fracture fragments must be recognized and corrected, and any shortening must be accounted for. The orthosis is used until there is complete fracture healing, and then the patient is weaned away from it. This kind of walks you through a little bit of a timeline from our standpoint and what some of our goals are. Um, the main one, of course, is weaning out of a fracture orthosis. Generally, this is not something to where it's, all right, you're six weeks after, the gray chart tells me you're done, you're done. This is something to where we take an x-ray, this is something to where we say it looks good, but let's wear it for four hours a day and then we can start you off from there or whatever the physician, uh, whatever the orthotist decides is best at that time. Femoral fractures, um, again, sometimes crossing a joint, sometimes off the shelf, sometimes custom. So fracture must be aligned by means of traction for a sufficient period to obtain intrinsic stability. Um, sometimes they're off the shelf, sometimes they're custom. A lot of the times they need surgical intervention as well, something we talked about. Uh, femoral fractures, like we saw earlier from the blue lines that streak all the way down the femur, can cause that to fracture in a spiral and can also fracture in what we talked about a little bit with the dislocation fracture, meaning not only is it fractured, it is actually not where it needs to be and it needs to be reduced and realigned. Now, sometimes we can do this orthotically, sometimes with a femur, it needs to be done surgically and that's where you get into intramedullary narrowing and stuff like that. That's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about braces. Traction is also important to prevent shortening, reduce swelling and pain. The fracture orthosis is applied usually after four to six weeks post-injury, and that will get delayed even more if it's obviously post-operatively. It is important to actively and passively mobilize the knee joint and ankle joint, even during traction application. So a mobilization, again, does not necessarily mean bracing, but it does mean that we want to make sure that through some methodology, we are keeping this fracture, we are allowing those three stages to, to uh, occur in exactly the format in which we need them to happen. So this is an example of an off-the-shelf uh, femoral fracture brace. It's adjustable thigh section, meaning that um, these uprights, it does have metal uprights or aluminum uprights running up and up down the inside and the outside of the brace, um, but you can still squeeze it in terms of how tight it is with those Velcro straps. Um, polypropylene is a thermoplastic material um, something that you can heat up in an oven. We can easily shape, trim, bend, pad, anything like that. It's um, very adjustable. This, while you can't see it, would have a foot insert that goes inside of the shoe. The ankle joint could come in a variety of ways. The ankle joint could just be free motion. It could stop. It could allow some motion. Um, the suspension through this is achieved through the femoral condyle extensions and the foot insert. The total contact, the hydrostatic pressure that we talked about, important for tissue compression and maintaining alignment. And then we use this to monitor angular deformation. So we will take x-rays of this, we'll take radiographic imaging of this, and we'll make sure that as the patient wears this throughout the process that we're able to see, all right, yes, we're doing our job. Yes, we're happy with how this looks. Tibial plateau fractures. Um, again, same concepts here. We need to cross a knee joint. Uh, these can come off the shelf or custom. Um, these are post-surgical, these are post-fixation, if need be, through nailing and such. Um, again, the main thing with these, actually arguably more important with these, is the range of motion. Um, you have ligament attachments, you have insertion origin points um, near a tibial plateau to where we don't necessarily want you allowed to fully extend your knee because when we talk about avulsion fractures, you can get a little chip of that bone coming off. Even if the uh, fracture is incomplete, let's say it just has a, a, a single slit running through the middle of it and it's not entirely across, because of those insert insertion and origin points, if we allow you to fully extend your knee, can keep pulling, that tendon, those ligaments can keep pulling on that bone to the point where we then, for, where we then do have a complete fracture. And that's why we'll put you in a brace, make sure you can't fully extend your knee, monitor it accordingly. Ankle fractures. A variety of shapes, sizes, when you talk about the small little bones in your ankle and how they're, how they're shaped, how they work together. Um, so a little bit of a gross exaggeration in terms of how we would manage an ankle fracture, but ankle fractures we, we generally want to stabilize. Um, important to note about this brace is that it does have what we just call a rocker bottom and that it doesn't have a flat-soled shoe. 
So when you hit your heel, the angle of your ankle won't change a lot as soon as you hit your heel. Your foot won't slap down like it would in any other sort of shoe. It'll just kind of roll over, and that's through the first, second, and third rockers of gait. Um, surgical treatment of displaced and unstable fractures recommended to allow early range of motion and weight bearing. So while we want you to not necessarily freely move your ankles, we do want you to start putting some weight on it to let your body know that this thing needs blood, this thing needs to get moving, and I'm putting some weight on it, I'm using it, and you need to abide by Wolf's Law and let me start, let me start healing. So post-surgical treatment is achieved with walking boot to allow initial mobilization, early weight bearing. Metatarsal fractures, the very ends, the bony parts of your toes. Um, commonly seen are metatarsal stretch fractures that are treated conventionally with immobilization through walking boots like we see at the top. These can also be weaned into functional foot orthotics, which essentially redistribute, kind of even out the pressure to where they're not just on your heels and just on the fat pads of your feet. Um, foot, functional foot orthotics can mean, usually mean a higher arch um, to get weight where you're not otherwise putting weight. Um, but foot orthotics can be used long term with appropriate shoes in addition to immediately kind of weaning out of a brace or immediately um, after a fracture. Toe fractures, again, heal very quickly. These generally don't require um, a lot of bracing, but they can be put in a post-operative shoe. Um, I'm sure almost everyone here has had to wear something similar to this or seen something similar to this at some point. It's a rigid sole. It doesn't allow those toes to bend a lot because we wanna kind of immobilize it as best we can. So you get put in a very hard soled shoe that doesn't allow you to roll over your toes and therefore we're keeping the fracture somewhat aligned. We're keeping everything relatively stable while we're still weight bearing, we're still getting good blood supply, good blood flow. Humeral fracture closed. Humeral fractures can be broken down into, again, a multitude of classifications. This is, again, going back to the Sarmiento method of how everything is donned and off. Um, humeral fractures, the big thing here is that we still want um, good hydrostatic pressure, and I'll skip all the way down to the second to last, which is gravity. So we don't necessarily want to hold this thing high and tight and just squeeze it. If we need to distract, if we need to properly align that humerus, we'll let gravity do its work, and we'll let gravity kind of pull that, that humerus, that fractured humerus, back into a good alignment before we then just decide to squeeze down on it. That's the main thing with humeral fracture bracing. Um, here's a good photo of a Sarmiento brace. This is very soft on the inside. It's uh, relatively shiny and plastic on the outside, but I promise you it's a good healing environment for the skin. Um, that strap that goes across is to make sure that it doesn't rotate. The strap is not necessarily for the fracture. It's to make sure the brace stays where it is and does not rotate freely or slide up and down on the patient. This patient does not entirely have her arm bent, but sometimes that's what we want. We want that arm bent at at least a 90 degree angle so gravity can do its work and distract that humerus while it heals. Stockinet is also applied over the arm to allow for absorption of um, perspiration. We'll change those out like socks. Again, when we talk about casting versus bracing, the big, exam the big benefit is you can take these off occasionally, sometimes, and therefore you can change out the stockinet, which essentially acts like a sock. Wash that thing, get it clean, put a new one on, you're generally doing a lot better at that point. Humeral fracture orthoses kind of continued here. Over the shoulder design, uh, cuff and collar, which is that sling that I talked about, is worn in the first one to three weeks to allow gravity to pull down. It's important to remove the cuff and collar frequently, exercise the elbow, exercise the wrist. Again, these functional bracing systems are doing multiple things. We're mobilizing, we're sometimes hydrostatically loading, and we're also moving at the same time. So we'll have that patient rotate through these stages. Initial passive and gradual active exercises are recommended. Ulnar fractures, the forearm fractures. Uh, conventional treatment um, can be uh, found beneficial where there has been little, little to no axial loading. When fracture dislocations occur, a cast is applied with elbow at 90 degrees of flexion and forearm in a relaxed supinated position. To show you a photo of what this may look like. Um, this is a relatively, um, I don't want to say new, but this is getting more and more commonly used. This is an example of um, what's called an exo. So you can even kind of see their little label there at the bottom. Um, this is an exo brace. So what this does is when we talk about off the shelf bracing, we're talking about, again, size large left and we order it and we can generally fit it. What this is, is this is a size large left, but this whole thing with a, a, a slowly contracting what we call a BOA system where you turn a dial and it squeezes down on itself. This whole thing, this whole brace can go in essentially a, uh, an oven. I don't want to call it that, it sounds a little harsh, but it goes in an oven. And what it does is it gets warm 
And once it's at a good temperature that's tolerable to the patient, what we can do is we can slide this over the patient's skin as is, tighten it down, and as we tighten it, it kind of thermoforms to the patient's limb. These come in um, different shapes, sizes. They are not just for ulnas, but um, this is just a really good example to talk about what kind of exosystems do and kind of where our field is gravitating towards with regards to uh, fracture orthoses that can be managed with this types of system. So, um, full range of motion exercises of the shoulder, elbow, wrist, and hand are continued to prevent stiffness and contractures. So, while the exosystem is cool in and of itself, the goals are still the same. It really hasn't changed what we're trying to do or what our methodology of doing that is. Forearm, both bone fractures, this gets complicated. Um, what we're essentially trying to do is we're trying to provide a functional brace that is beneficial after an adequate closure reduction and maintained for two weeks. So both bone meaning um, ulna and radius. So we have the two bones running through the forearm as if both been fractured. Um, if the reduction is maintained for two weeks, the patient can be transitioned into functional bracing, generally after a cast. Um, considerable intrinsic stability is necessary in both bone fracture of the forearm. So again, we're talking about something like this. Um, this is not an exospace. This is a little bit old school, but um, this is also something to where uh, totally tolerable, totally um, removable by the patient for the patient. And the patient can be transitioned into a wrist splint um, after the cast or sometimes pre-casting, um, depending on where the patient's at in the healing process. Clavicle <coughs> fractures, um, one of the more, most common types of fractures. Um, broken ends of the bones may not have significantly shifted, but you may not need surgery. The collar bones can heal without surgery. Um, it's common to lose some shoulder and arm strength. Gentle exercise to prevent stiffness and weakness are crucial. More strenuous exercises are started gradually once the fracture is completely healed. So this is an example of a clavicle orthosis. What this is designed to do is it's designed to simply kind of, um, much like a backpack, it's designed to kind of like retract the shoulders AD or abduct the shoulders. And what we're doing there is we're kind of realigning as best we can that clavicle to where it needs to be, dependent on where the fracture is, dependent on the severity, the type, all that good stuff. Um, it's just called a figure eight for the most part. Um, figure eight clavicle brace helps maintain the appropriate position, allows the clavicle to heal faster, and uh, is done for positioning. Donning this is important. Um, when we talk about what kind of orthosis we would give to a patient to don by themselves, if you can imagine you have a clavicle fracture, you have an arm and a shoulder that hurts, putting these on by yourself is not easy, it's not fun. Um, so if we have a pediatric patient, for example, we're fitting the patient for the most part, but we're really educating the parents. We're really talking to mom, we're really talking to dad about how you put this thing on, how you care for it. We're not gonna let this kid put it on by himself at school. So we're giving written instructions, we're giving verbal instructions to the parents about this is how it's to be put on. The, the kid and yourself, if you had one, probably couldn't put this on by themselves. So. Spinal fracture devices really range in topics. Um, I do not have enough time to talk about all of them, but we're trying to control pain limited by motion. We're unloading discs in some cases, vertebrae and spinal structures by compression. Uh, we're stabilizing weak, injured structures and mobilizing the spine, the spine post-surgically. And we're providing a three-point pressure system in a lot of the cases to provide correction or prevent progression of a deformity. Um, I will not go through all the nerves, all the, um, all the different types of lesions that go into uh, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar and sacral um, injuries, but spinal fractures are probably a lecture in and of themselves. So a quick overview of the types of spinal bracing. Um, we can talk about low back pain, degenerative disc disorders, or postural deformities. Um, this is not bracing, but scoliosis bracing is a great example of three-point pressure systems. Um, rigid orthoses are front and back panels. They, they uh, provide, excuse me, complete immobilization of the specific area of the spine. So starting at the top, cervical bracing. Cervical collars provide some mechanical restraint to flexion, extension, and to a lesser degree, lateral flexion, extension, and rotation. Um, while not a very important part of what we do, kinesthetic reminders are sometimes a very important part of bracing, to be honest. So um, you may have a neck fracture, and while we're not completely immobilizing, while we're not squeezing your throat to immobilize the fracture, we are letting you know you have a fracture and therefore you need to wear a brace just to remind you at all times. It is very easy, as some of you may know, to get up in the middle of the night, 
to walk around and not realize that you have a fracture. So sometimes, um, while we don't necessarily like to admit it, while we like to think we're like healing everything and everyone, we're a lot of the times with cervical orthosis simply letting you know you have a fracture. So uh, minor injuries of the cervical spine uh, can go in something uh, such as a soft collar, which is down at the bottom. When we talk about patient compliance, we also talk about um, what patients can tolerate for bathing and showering. So the top one is a Miami J collar. That's not important. Um, what is important is that it doesn't tolerate moisture or water very well. The bottom one, the foam collar, is a closed cell foam, meaning that it doesn't absorb moisture or um, smells very well. So that can tolerate a shower a little bit better. Cervical bracing should be applied snug to prevent any movement in the cervical spine. Should be worn at all times unless otherwise instructed. Comes with an extra set of pads, which is great, again, for hygiene. Um, and it can be uh, watchful of any pressure areas, or I'm sorry, the patient needs to be watchful of any pressure areas or redness. Cervical thoracic bracing, again, when we talk about a joint in the lower extremity, same thing can apply when we talk about different areas of the spine. So a CTO, a CTO or cervical thoracic orthoses, um, can cross multiple areas. So here we see that previously Miami J style, and we have a connection to it, to where we're actually acting on the thoracic spine, the chest as well, and we're limiting uh, bending forward, backward, left, right, flexion extension. Um, Anterior section consists of a sternal plate, uh, mandibular support, and a posterior section with an interscapillary plate, posterior uprights, and occipital support. Yes, that's a lot. Yes, we know these are uncomfortable. These are generally prescribed um, only when needed. Um, if you see somebody in these, it's not because they have a tiny little chip. It's because they probably have something that a physician is worried about with regards to further injury or potentially paralysis in some case, we are um, generally trying to do a lot of control. Uh, when we talk about long lever arms, this will give us that. This will give us a long lever arm to enact on a, on a fracture that we're very concerned about. Um, this will, again, restrict flexion extension of the head in addition to the uh, thoracic spine. Thoracic bracing kind of continued with regards to cervical thoracic bracing, height and volume adjustments, custom fit, that Miami J that we just saw does have um, extension panels. So while it is, again, going back into off-the-shelf categories, it doesn't necessarily mean that it just fits and we throw it on. That has a lot of adjustability. Comes with extra pads, should be applied snug, should be worn at all times unless otherwise instructed by a physician. Halo orthoses. These are uh, fracture orthoses in a different realm. So these actually involve um, kind of the two worlds of uh, fracture bracing and surgical intervention. Um, when we go to fit a halo orthosis, it is generally because the patient has a very concerning high, a very high or proximal fracture on the C1, the C2, the atlas, or the axis, and we're concerned about how those two bones are interacting with each other, meaning that um, if a fracture were to split, if it were to cross a nerve that we did not want it to cross, that um, everything below that nerve or everything that nerve innervates is therefore lost. So halo orthoses are used, um, again, much like a CTO, very much when only needed. Um, halo immobilizes the head and the cervical spine. It can provide distracting force. That means that these are laid while the patient's supine or laying down, and we're actually looking to go ahead and pull that head up just a little bit to make sure that nothing's grinding down on itself. Whereas we want gravity to do the job, whereas we want gravity to work for us in a Sarmiento orthosis, we want the exact opposite here. We want no gravity. We want to make sure that thing is as free floating as possible. Its basic components are a halo ring, um, a distraction rod, and a distal padded vest. Four pins are placed equally around the skull. Uh, pins are placed, um, we have specific landmarks for these pins to avoid the sinuses, to avoid the temporal nerves. Essentially, we have four pins that completely immobilize the head. Uh, for pediatric patients, we might drop these pins down. We want essentially 32 newtons per square inch total around the circumference of the head. So if we use four pins, that means we have eight in each pin, eight, 16, 24, 32. If we have six pins, it means we want a little less pressure. So we'll kind of equal out how much we total 32, we use more or less pins. Um, once the halo pins and the vest are secured in place, radiographic images are taken to ensure appropriate alignment of the spine. Again, our concepts don't change here a lot, just our methodology of doing that has changed a lot. Halo care, um, when you talk about whether or not a patient is going to be able to use an orthosis by themselves, never more important than with a halo. Do they have someone who can help? 
Do we need to keep them here in the hospital to make sure we're closely monitoring this thing? We can use cotton swabs or Q-tips uh, with soap and water, hydrogen peroxide to clean the skin around the pin sites. So each site that goes into the head, we can actually go ahead and make sure that area is clean to make sure we don't have any infection. We've essentially created a, an open wound in and of itself, so we want to make sure that is closely monitored, closely managed. Clean the area in the skin around your vest every day with an alcohol moistened towel. Every two or three days, do not use soap, lotions, powders under your vest. Do not take a shower. Use sponge baths, I'm sorry, to clean for the rest of your body. Wash your hair with dry shampoo products or tuck a towel under your neck and lean over a sink. Do not get the vest wet. These are instructions we would give to the patient. We fully understand how annoying these are. We also understand how important this fracture is. Halo complications with any sort of other skin complications, infections, um, we even have more complications now because we can worry about a pin loosening, whereas we wouldn't necessarily worry about a Sarmiento or another fracture brace loosening a lot as long as it's uh, applied tightly. You can't easily kind of re-screw the pins back in. So we're making sure that we're retorquing to the eight or the six or the four um, newtons per square inch. And we want to make sure that our balance issues are good, sleeping problems, as you can imagine, this thing does not come off, so you need to keep this on 24-7, and that involves sleeping upright. It can involve sleeping laying down with towels, with all sorts of contraptions, and then ne neck muscle weakness. So when we take this halo off, we don't just, again, we talked about weaning out of a brace. We don't just let these people walk around freely. They're instantly going to go into a Miami J or a cervical collar because not only is that fracture probably still a little bit concerning, it also means that those neck muscles are weak. They're not going to be able to freely support the weight of their head because it's been essentially self-sustained with the halo. So now we're going to make sure that we have them in a Miami J or another sort of cervical uh, orthoses moving forward. TLSOs, um, we're going back into the, uh, this is a uh, thoracolumbar sacral orthoses. That's why we just say TLSO. Rigid bivalve, meaning kind of like a turtle shell design. There's a front, there's a back. These have straps along the sides that you can pull snugly. These are rigid TLSOs, recommended for a mobilization of the spine during a uh, time from a fracture after a spinal surgery, made of rigid plastic. Again, rigid on the outside, very soft, very user-friendly, so to speak, on the inside. Custom made for measurements, usually fit the next day. That sounds a little insane, and it is to me. I still don't know how certain manufacturers do this, but we can simply take like 30 or so measurements of a circumference, of a waist, of a everything length, send it out, and we get a really good fitting TLSO the very next day. That has obviously not always been the case, but um, there are companies that do it, and we love them for it. So custom made for measurements, straps on either side. We can do over the shoulder straps if suspension, if keeping the brace up is an issue. We can provide pads, cut out reliefs, all that kind of stuff. A TLSO should be worn at all times when out of bed. If we're worried about, again, sort of a fracture enacting on itself when we talk about gravity, um, it's not necessarily a big deal if you're laying down. We're not worried about gravity enacting on the fracture. Whenever you're out of bed, that's when the TLSO is going to be used. They should be done snug to prevent any sort of movement within the brace, and the brace should be worn until the fracture heals completely or unless otherwise advised by the physician. Functional fracture bracing applications and outcomes, depending on the type, classification, the location, and the severity of the fractures amongst other factors. That is essentially the end of the lecture.